US-Iran tensions still continue on, and since the last video, I've had people ask me to go into more detail specifically on Iranian defenses. Despite what you see in the news, how they have been portraying war to pretty much break out any moment, I don't believe that's the case. Although I'd probably get more views and clicks if I said the opposite. Both countries' leaders and people are against it, but if war did break out between the two of them, what kind of fight could Iran put up? First, the conflict would mainly occur in the Persian Gulf and immediate surrounding region. There would likely be Iranian-backed groups like Hezbollah, likely setting up attacks on US assets and US allies further west, and cyber attacks carried out by the Iranian Cyber Defense Command. But most of these attacks you read about in the news require a lot of time to set up, write specific code and exploits, infiltrate the computer network, and then identify your target and launch the attack. There are less complicated, less time-consuming cyber attacks they could carry out, but these have less of an impact. So besides these, the conflict would mostly be confined to the region. Iran, while having a relatively large military, cannot carry out operations further away from home. Ever since World War II, the US has been a dominant power in the air. Through its large air force and aircraft carrier fleet, the US seeks to control the skies in any conflict, in what is called air superiority. Without air superiority, it is virtually impossible to win a war, as the enemy would constantly be bombing and destroying any offensive you launch. Iran has a decent sized air force, but much of it dates back to before the Iranian Revolution in 1979. For fighters, they have several F-14s, which they received from the US in the late 70s. The exact number of them that are operational is unknown. They originally received 79 F-14s, lost 10 to 20 in the Iran-Iraq war, they lost a few more to accidents over the years, including another one in early May, and others have become inoperable due to a lack of maintenance, parts, and being scrapped for parts to repair other F-14s. And that is a major issue for them, the lack of parts. After the revolution, the US banned arms sales to Iran, and kept a close eye on spare parts from its own F-14 fleet, making sure that they did not reach Iran. Despite this, Iran has been able to keep approximately 40 flying, by manufacturing their own equipment and buying the illegal spare parts on the black market. They also developed their own version of the long-range Phoenix air-to-air -air missile called the Fekor-90, as their own arsenal of Phoenix missiles ran low after the war. Despite the age of the F-14, it's still a highly capable fighter, and its long-range missiles can pose a serious threat to US AWACS and tanker aircraft. If successful in shooting some of these aircraft down, it could hurt the US's ability to maintain air superiority in the region. They also operate the F-5, another US fighter jet. Around 70 of these are believed to be operational. The F-5 is a small but highly capable fighter and is still used today, including its variants and derivatives, across the world. Iran has built their own versions of the aircraft as well, creating the Saqui and the Kausar. On top of these, Iran has 30 to 40 older MiG-29s, 60 US F-4s, 20 Su-22s, 20 Mirage F-1s, and two dozen Chinese J-7s which can be used to defend the country. But if their air bases are destroyed, those aircraft are useless. One of the first things the US would do is target these bases, with long-range cruise missiles like Tomahawk and JASM. We have seen the US do this many times, in Iraq, Libya, Syria, and others. Targeting hangars, runways, radars, ammo and fuel depots, and more. While runways can often be repaired relatively quickly, losing facilities like fuel depots and maintenance facilities can have long-term effects. To counter this, Iran has built up its ground-based air defenses. One of the often overlooked aspects of air defense is early warning radars. People tend to focus on the guns or missiles, but if you don't know where the target is, those weapons are useless. Iran has a large number of radar sites spread across the country. One specific radar worth mentioning is called the Nebo-M a new advanced Russian-made radar system with pretty impressive capabilities, including being better able to detect stealth aircraft like the US F-22, F-35, and B-2 stealth bomber. As for missiles, one of the more widely used systems is Hawk, specifically the more capable IHAWK, which is another US system received before the revolution. You can find these sites spread across Iran defending military bases, nuclear sites, and other high-valued targets. They have also developed their own versions of Hawk as well, Older Chinese and Soviet HQ-2 and the long-range S-200 sites are also widespread. Their long range gives them the ability to defend a wide area, but they are dated and not mobile, making them more vulnerable to attack. Various medium-range, highly mobile systems also exist, such as Cub, Buck, knockoffs of each of these, and a version of the Chinese HQ-7 are also operated in significant numbers. 
all of which could pose a serious threat to U.S. aircraft operating in the area. But the most capable system they operate has to be the Russian S-300. Iran operates both the S-300P and the PMU-2, and is believed to have four batteries of each. In case you're wondering, the P means mobile. The original S-300P version is no longer in production. The M means that it is modified, and the U means upgraded. The 2 means that it is a second upgrade of that version. The S300 PMU-3 was renamed to the S400. These systems are mobile, but have been spotted in satellite imagery around the capital of Tehran, the nuclear sites of Fordo and Bushir, Eshfahan, and a temporary site at Mashhad. These would pose probably the largest threat to US aircraft given their long range, capability, and mobility. The site at Eshfahan is interesting. For fun, I set up an S-300 site with the same number of launchers and radars in DCS, and with the F-A-18 Hornet armed with anti-radiation missiles, I flew from Iraq, low under the radar horizon, to attack it. There are a number of hills in the area, which enabled me to get close and approach it undetected and take out the site. Now this is a video game, the ranges, capabilities, reaction times are estimated, and it did in fact turn other Iranian radar sites or interceptor aircraft but it shows the importance of placing these sites in an area with a clear field of view of its surroundings, so that this could not happen. Originally, Russia hesitated to sell the system to Iran due to US pressure, so Iran began developing their own version of the S-300. A few years later, Russia did sell them the system, but Iran also finished their own, called the Bavar 373. The Bavar 373 is a similar system to the S-300, with similar radars and missiles. And finally, for defending against low-flying U.S. cruise missiles, they have TOR. TOR has proven to be quite capable in Syria, even more successful than Pantsir if open-source information is to be believed. TOR was designed from the ground up specifically to shoot down these cruise missiles, and Iran is about 30 of them. Next, instead of waiting for these missiles to fly over and hope to shoot them down, Iran has weaponry to sink the U.S. destroyers and carriers that launch them. I've gone over this before, but Iran has hundreds and hundreds of missile boats, armed with anti-ship missiles and virtually nothing else, whose sole purpose is to rush out in swarms and attack naval ships by simply overwhelming them. On top of these are dozens of land-based anti-ship missile sites, like this one. And there is a concern here. Since it would be in Iran's interest to sink these vessels before they're able to launch tomahawks and strike aircraft, it could potentially lead to a precipitated attack if Iran believed that war is inevitable. To help mitigate the threat these pose, as I said in the last video, the US would likely keep its carrier strike group further back away from Iran out in the Arabian Sea, using cruise missiles and aircraft to attack. And that is exactly what the US has done recently. As of the time of writing this, the US carrier, the Abraham Lincoln, has not entered the Persian Gulf, but stayed further out in the Arabian Sea. And finally, one of Iran's best defenses is its offense. Iran has invested large amounts of money into their ballistic missile program in recent years, and has built up a massive stockpile, and is quickly developing newer and more accurate ones. In a conflict with the US, Iran would undoubtedly launch hundreds of these missiles at US forces. These missiles have shorter ranges and cannot reach the US, most only able to reach the immediate region. The accuracy of these weapons is disputed, but a ballistic missile strike in Syria back in June of 2017, using what was believed to be a Shahab-3 and Zulfiar missiles launched from Iran, hit targets over 600 kilometers away. These strikes show that the accuracy of these weapons is increasing. US forces at bases such as al udeid and al Dafra, just across the Gulf would almost certainly be targets. Knocked out runways, hangars, or even groups of aircraft parked on the apron could cause major losses, and possibly even make the airbase inoperable for a time. To defend against these attacks, Patriot missile defense batteries are set up around those bases. The Patriot site at El Dafra has over a dozen launchers visible, and is expanding to accommodate more. I'll save land warfare for another video, but with US air superiority, Iranian tanks and troops would be at a severe disadvantage. All this has the ability to inflict some pretty heavy losses on the US, but at the most it would only slow them down, not stop them completely. The US has bases virtually surrounding Iran, in Afghanistan to the east, Iraq and Turkey to the west, and Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain, and the US Navy by sea to the south. If it came to an all-out conflict, Iran would lose. The only hopes being that they can get other nations like China or Russia involved to negotiate a ceasefire or the US public loses its appetite after losses and ends the war. 
Regardless of the final outcome, let's hope we never get there. And before you go, I want to talk about a real cool game I came across called The Life Simulator. In the game, you get to make choices on how to run your life. You can live your life any way you want. You can even be a cop or a soldier, and even work your way up to become the major of the army. There are so many options. On top of that, you pick where you want to live, pay rent, have to manage your work life, social life, your health, happiness, and more. My girlfriend in the game actually just ended up breaking up with me for ignoring her, and I've been working on getting my business degree while flipping burgers, all while sleeping on a park bench to save money. There is a seemingly endless amount of options. You can even start a YouTube channel as a side gig to make extra money. It's a really addicting game. I've actually had a lot of fun playing it, and honestly I'm going to keep playing it. The game has great reviews on the App Store, a lot of people love it, and I can honestly say that I'm one of them. And it's free too, so go check it out on the App Store on your iPhone. Again, that is the Life Simulator. Give it a try.